see you guys. Colin, <laughs> Colin is strict. These are the truants. <laughs> this is what Maria was saying. I know they're going to be disciplined by Sharice, our principal. <laughs> I was gonna say we have a program for that. If you... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Don! Thank you so much for joining us and being such a good sport with coming in early for our fireside chat. So DCY efforts. I hope you're there. I don't know. Maybe you guys can give us like a hand up or something behind your screen. Because <laughs> now Maria's here and she's watching. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sorry, I had to take a phone call, but yes. <laughs> Hi, Don. Hi, Maria. Okay, so we have Don. Oh my God, Don. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I don't know. Stickle. Butcher. Stickle. It, you'd never know by looking, but I blame my husband's family. So. <laughs> and Don is the co founder and executive director of Sunset Youth Services. And we are very lucky to have her join us today so that we can learn more, look under the hood of one of our beloved grantee agencies. So um, I just want to kind of just get right into it since we have a nice 30 minutes in front of us. But let's start off with just some quick introductions. I gave your name and your title. But what we'd love to do as an icebreaker is for you to answer the question, DCYF's tagline is making San Francisco a great place to grow up. So we want to know, do you believe San Francisco is a great place to grow up? And tell us why. That feels like such a trick question. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I will say, I, my son would say, yes, it's a great place to grow up. So I think that's a good place for me to start. Uh, I think young people that we, that, well, starting with my staff, I didn't grow up here. So, but um, most of our staff were born and raised here. Most of the kids that we obviously work with. Um, I think by and large, people would say, yes, it's a great place to grow up. I think San Francisco offers a lot of really rich opportunities. Um, a lot of, of recognition of, um, you know, things that matter, right? Like, respecting people's gender, respecting people's pronouns, respecting people's body rights and all of those kinds of things. I feel like we're always on the front of all of that. I think, um, and we just have such amazing museums and parks and, you know, just diversity is just in general. I think I struggle when I realize like how inaccessible San Francisco can be for so many folks and how it has continued to get more and more um, inaccessible. And I think I'm always amazed at how few of the things that we, um, that we might take for granted kids have actually had the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, when we take kids on field trips places and I find out they're like, you know, 17 years old and they've never been to like, you know, places that we just take for granted. And so, and I think just recognizing more and more how many families have had to leave the city and um, you know, are just being pushed out of neighborhoods that they've been in. So I think it is really a double-edged sword. I think it has a lot of great stuff to offer. And obviously we all believe in it or we wouldn't be here. Um, but I think I just get sad that more and more often, I feel like I'm in meetings with service providers and other folks that just don't live in the city anymore. And they work here, but they're paying bridge tolls, you know, to get back into a city that they love because they can't afford to be here. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and just uh, Sunset Youth Services operates out of District 4. So it's quite the commute if you don't have a car. Um, so tell us, where are you from and what brought you to San Francisco? So I grew up in Denver. Um, and but I, I kind of moved around a lot. I was living in Hawaii when uh, when my husband and I met each other and I was dancing um, with a like a performing group and he was on the road with the band. We had a mutual friend who was like, oh, you need to meet the bass player in this band. You guys would really like each other. And obviously we did. So, um, and then we were, Ron, so Ron and I were living in Anaheim and we were, we got asked to be youth pastors actually at a church here in San Francisco. Mm. And we moved up here to do that. And we were trying to find out, um, you know, we were very young and idealistic and kind of were like, hell yeah, we'll do this. Like, 
Um, and so we tried to find out a lot of stuff and we couldn't really, you know, people were like, oh, the kids are just wild, right? That was all we ever got told. And so the first Sunday that we were on site at the church, one of the kids from the youth group was in the hospital because he had been shot the night before. Um, and that started our kind of trajectory into like, oh, nobody in this church actually knows what's going on with these kids. The church itself had maybe like 40 adults and there was like, at least 40 teenagers that were coming and they were not the kids of the adults in the church. They were just neighborhood kids. So we just started following those kids into the systems that were affecting their life. And, you know, as Ron says, like we are a couple of white folks, you may not have noticed, but um, we try to keep that hidden as much as possible. But, um, you know, we didn't set out necessarily to do anything for you know, black and brown kids in particular, or anything like we just followed kids into the systems that were affecting their lives. And, um, and Sunset Youth Services was really born out of the recognition that there was a gap on the west side of the city for, um, for services and opportunities. And at that point in time, every time we would talk to the mayor's office, they would always say, oh, well, we funded that in the Richmond, as if like the Richmond and the Sunset were close enough or the same neighborhood, right? Like, not recognizing that the park is a completely, like it's a whole barrier, it's a whole different, anyway, you all know. So a lot of the early years was really like proving all the things that we were seeing and um, dealing with. And, and since then we have, def we've stayed in this neighborhood. We definitely are a citywide agency. Um, as you know, by looking at our demographics, most of our kids are not from district four. But we've stayed here because kids have asked us to stay here. And, um, and I think that it's really worth noting that our kids have said um, multiple times that they would rather take a long bus ride to get to us and be out of the sort of chaos of their neighborhood, as well as the fact that we are able to hold sort of these um, kind of tense relationships or like uneasy truces at Sunset Youth Services that we really couldn't hold if we were kind of in somebody's neighborhood, right? It would be like, these are the only kids who can come or the only folks who can come. But we have really through the years managed to bridge um, multiple kind of like set issues by really using music um, uh, uh, to like let people experience each other as humans. And uh, multiple times we've had kids say things like, yeah, right now, like my folks are killing their, his folks, but I'm realizing that's my brother. Right. And, um, some of those guys, um, are now in their early thirties and they actually opened a studio together and, um, are doing their, you know, kind of doing their stuff together now. So I think we've stayed out here a lot in response to what people have asked us to do and to just kind of be a space that offers some kind of air and you know and that and there is stuff going on in district four that people don't know about that you know is often ignored there is a lot more section eight out here than people know there is a lot more kind of going on but really the truth is we're staying where the kids want us to be yeah can you talk about how your programming is scaled through the years <laughs> uh yeah so i think um so for those of you who don't know, uh, Ron and I, my husband and I started this together with a couple friends, um, one of which is still working with us, one of which you might, all, some of you old timers might remember Michael Funk, who was the director of the Sunset Neighborhood Beacon Center. We started, the four of us started, Delvin Mack, who's our operations um, uh, guy now. We all started this together in uh, 1992. And then we, when the Beacon Initiative came, we kind of rolled off some of the stuff we were doing that made more sense for that to the Sunset Neighborhood Beacon Center. And Mike went to direct that. And we really were having an internal struggle at that point in time between like, who are we really serving? And Ron and I have always had a heart for um, sort of the kids that nobody else really wanted around, if I'm just going to be completely honest, right? The kids that were being arrested, being kicked out of school, the kids that weren't actually welcome to stay at Beacon Centers for the most part. Um, those were like, those were our kids. So, um, so we, so we split off what made sense to split off and Sunset Youth Services stayed for very, for a lot of years as just like 
um, you know, a small, very grassroots, like really relational. And we, and that's something we still hold very, very dear. We didn't want to grow. Um, we actually, uh, the Delvin and Ron and I, I think actively sort of fought against scaling for a long time because we saw a lot of bigger organizations really lose touch with what they were doing. And I knew a lot of EDs that didn't really know what was happening on the ground level. And um, like I, I was walking through a youth center. This is a small side note, but I was walking, getting the tour of a new youth center from a friend of mine. And this is down in Southern California, but he was the ED and a kid went running by, running by in the hall. And he said, Hey, don't run in here. And the kid turned around and said, who the fuck are you? And I was like, I'm never going to be that ED. Like, I'm never going to be an ED that the kids don't know. Like, that's just not something I want. And so, um, so we were, we've always been super slow and intentional about any growth that we do take. Um, we started, I mean, we started in our garage. So yes, we have grown. <laughs> um, and uh, we started with just the three of us and, and actually none of us were being paid um, for quite a while. Um, and, you know, a lot of things that I probably wouldn't recommend other people do, we did. We, Ron and I didn't have um, our son yet. We were lived on, we maxed out credit cards. We had no business maxing out as newlyweds. Like it just was probably not the best plan. But um, as opportunities that have made sense have come along, we've taken them. And we have now scaled to um, where we are, which is, um, I mean, think some things I just don't, ma I don't think really matter, but just perspective, right? Like our budget's now like two and a half million dollars. Um, we're getting, and we're getting an additional million and a half from the state this year for capital, for a new um, building, a, an empty church that we've taken over here in the neighborhood um, that we've turned into our wellness center. And um, so we have that money coming in. We have um, like 25 staff. And, um, and so I think the ways that we have scaled, um, I think they have been intentional, although I don't think you ever can know on the front end how hard scaling is really going to be mm -hmm. until you're in it. And then it's just like, it really is sort of like, it will kick your ass. <laughs> and so I think we scaled with this round of uh, funding that we're currently in. And, and it took us a couple of years to really like, feel like we could come up for air. Um, it didn't help that COVID came in there, you know, and all of that. But I think, um, you know, we've added, we've added art therapy. We've added, um, a lot of, we've just been able to expand and go deeper with stuff that we were already, that we've done since our very beginning sort of inception, which is we are super relationship focused. And so that takes a lot of time and energy to be consistent. And for us, nobody really ever ages out. Like we just feel like relationships are forever. Family is forever. Like you don't age out of your family. And so, um, so there's a lot of energy that goes into keeping those relationships very current. And, um, and that's really the, the sort of the centerpiece of what we do and everything else we figure, we see all of our programs as expendable, right? If kids don't care about them and people stop caring about studios or stop caring about, um, you know, whatever we're doing, like cooking or whatever, then we can kill it, right? What, really matters is the relationships and what and all these programs are just a vehicle to go deeper in those relationships and earn the right to be kind of on this journey with folks yeah absolutely visiting your um center and even just visiting the block itself you really do feel the presence of just like the sense that youth services family on the block. And mm -hmm. the one thing that I, you know, you kind of touched on the fact that, you know, you were serving kids from across the city. But the one thing I experienced when when I went and visited in 2019 is that, you know, it's actually this region. And, you know, the one participant that we interviewed and we featured in 2019, Treasy, yeah. he came from Vallejo. And, you know, he moved around from a lot of different um, housing situations. And for him, he was very focused on, you know, like, you know, like for him to stay on his journey, to stay on this track, he had to do this commute, which was like planes, trains, and automobiles, but, you know, with a BART pass and, and, and a Muni pass. 
And so it really speaks to just like, um, you know, the, the, the quality of programming and, and what it means to an individual. So, you know, I, I, I do want you to go a little deeper and share with us, like, what are some of this unique demographic characteristics and the geographies of, of, of this community? Um, I'm glad you brought Treasy up. He's, when we met Treasy, he was living in the city. And so I think um, one thing that we're very committed to is following people wherever they are. Uh, I know that as you, you know, as we spoke to earlier, it's too expensive to stay in the city. And one thing that happens with a lot of families and, um, and young people is that they get into these programs where somebody gives them a housing program or a housing voucher, but they can't actually use it in the city. Um, and so they end up putting them out in like Panol or San Pablo where there's no services, there's no supports. And so, you know, they're coming back to us because that's where they, that's where they're fine. That's the home base. Right. And so our commitment is really around staying with people, no matter where they get, you know, pushed and shoved. Um, we, like I said earlier, we've really just gone, followed the people we love and care about into the systems that are affecting them. Because of that, we now have, um, uh, the sort of, I'll just start with this, the five kind of areas that we really focus on programmatically are things you probably know about, which is our digital arts program, which is, you know, all of our, all of our video production, music production, our mobile studio van, our sprinter van, um, the studios in the center, the web design, we now do like clothing branding. So we have a heat press and embroidery machine and screen printing and kids are branding their own clothes. And so that we're doing some kind of like entrepreneurial um, pieces with that, which is, which really is a part of our workforce. We've, we've shifted our workforce focus to entrepreneurial stuff. So pop-up things and, um, and really letting kids kind of look at how, where they want to get their hustle on, as opposed to like, let us put you in this position for minimum wage and, you know, for 10 hours a week. And you know what I mean? It's just, it just wasn't, that just wasn't the, the jam that they were looking for. Um, so workforce is our other, another one of our pieces. And then um, our justice um, services, which is in um, minors and young adults. So we do a lot with TAYA. If you look at our demographics, you will see we are primarily TAYA at this point. Um, but we, um, as many of you may know, there's now kids over 18 in the juvenile system. Um, and so we work very deeply in both of those systems. We do have up in juvenile hall, one of our studio, a mobile studio. So we have programming up in the halls for kids who are um, confined up there, but we also are, um, our case managers are in court, you know, just doing all the things that they do. And we're very relational in our case management. So it's, it's very much of, um, it's not about like, here's your appointment, come see me. And if you don't, you know, X, Y, Z, it's, it's less, it's much more relational mentoring case management. So it's much more like, let's work on how we're going to reach these goals together. Um, and then our family support, um, which our family support, we focus on teenage and TAYA parents, and then parents of teenagers. So we kind of have both ends of the spectrum covered. And we do, and we do triple P parenting intensive throughout the year, they're 12 week intensives. And I teach them for parents of teenagers. I teach at least twice a year. So about half of the year, at least I'm teaching triple P. Um, and then we do a lot of um, work with child welfare and teaching teen and Taya parents how to co-parent because like, oh, I love you so much. Let's make a baby. Now I hate you. And we have a baby. Like that's so common. And so really trying to sit with parents and help them understand what it looks like to like co-parent. Um, with somebody that you really can't stand anymore. Um, and so we do a lot of that kind of stuff. We have a diaper bank. Um, we do, yeah, anyway, so we're part, we're part of an FRC. Um, and so that's our focus. And then our final um, sort of prong is our healing arts, which is our newest um, program area. And that is our, we have an, a therapist on staff now that's an MFT and an art therapist. And we're adding another part-time art therapist to the team. And so we do individual therapy as well as a lot of art therapy centered groups. And, um, and we, really, we really rely a lot on word of mouth. I think we get a lot of referrals from 
attorneys and, you know, P less P well, adult POs, I'll say that <laughs> less POs in the juvenile system, but some, um, but we do, but our favorite really is word of mouth. Um, we are, we really rely a lot on kids who are like, Hey, I, I want to bring my friend in. They got arrested. And I told them that you guys could help them with this or, you know, just those kinds of things. Um, and we do like, we have kids from all over the city. Our, our biggest zip codes are, you know, in the Southeast part of the city. So Bayview, um, Sunnydale, this Valley, um, we know a lot of kids in that area. Um, and, and then a lot of kids from the Fillmore Western Edition and the Mission. Um, so it used to be very predominantly um, uh, Bayview. I think now it's, you know, some of those other neighborhoods have come up. And so um, it's a pretty good mix, but it's a lot of just kind of knowing who's in the building at any given time and what they need to be, what we need to be focusing on and who has beef with who. Um, but yeah, I think, back to sort of our attachment, our relationship, we wrote a, we wrote a paper um, called attachment communities um, that is really about our philosophy of how to do services. And it's something that Ron and I just believe with all of our hearts, which is like, you can have the coolest programs in the world. And if you're not building relationships with people, they really just don't matter that much. And, um, and I think that's where the tendency for creaming can come in because it's easier to do programs with some certain types of kids who may already be in a place where they're really receptive to, um, to that kind of structure or those kinds of things. And, um, and I think for us, we're really looking for like, who are the, who are, where are people feeling, where are the people who feel like they need someplace to belong, right? We all need, we all need that cheers moment where we walk through the door and people go norm, right? Like, um, I think, I, if people, if kids don't come around, we go find them, right? Like we, I, I recently have heard this, this organization in Baltimore that uses the, the phrase um, relentless outreach. And I think that, that just so triggers like a, a thing inside of me because that's always been our, like, Hey, has so-and-so, has anybody seen so-and-so? I haven't seen them for a week, like hit the road, right? Like we're out on the streets, finding our kids where are they? Let's go see um, what's going on because shame is huge. And when kids get to know you and love you and feel like they're letting you down, they will hide. Um, and so I think that's, that shame can be a big thing that keeps kids from, from engaging like, Oh, I screwed up and now I don't want to tell you or, um, or they just get caught up in their lives and they're trying to survive and they just don't. And, and honestly, COVID has not helped anybody. Right. So now there's like a lot of people who have kind of struggles with their own mental health and their own emotional, you know, feelings about being out and out and about and how safe is it? And, you know, just like people have kind of gotten into these um, cycles. A lot of our kids have really struggled a lot with mental health, with drug abuse and um, drug use. We've had a lot of kids die of overdoses during COVID. I think during COVID, we lost six of our kids to overdoses during the actual lockdown part of COVID. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think for us, it's really like whatever comes through the door, that's our, that's what we try to like focus on. Our, our focus is always stability first and then growth. And, um, and, you know, we, our goal is to get kids thriving, but you know, you got to stabilize first. So what does it look like? And if we don't have what you need, then we're going to help you find it. And we're going to like walk you, walk with you through it. So we don't necessarily have all the expertise on uh, in house, but we're going to figure out how to get you what you need so that, um, so that I feel like navigating these systems are hard enough for those of us who have an idea of how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times where at the end of the day, I'm like, I don't know how people expect kids to do any of this or families or young adults. Like how are people supposed to navigate these systems that are so completely uh, non-accessible to them. And so, um, so we really spend a lot of our time and barrier removal and like my family, one of my family success coaches, I heard her so many times say, I may not have what you need, but I'll cry with you. Like, and literally like, like that's a thing, right? Like sitting mm -hmm. in somebody else's pain is a sacred place to be. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like 
we end up doing that a lot. Like I, I feel where you're at and my heart is so in it with you. And like, let's try to figure it out together. Yeah. No, I don't I think, know if I answered your question. No, but. you, you totally answered the question. And then you answered the next question, which was <laughs> about the unique approach that you guys provide to create a sense of home, a sense of family, a sense of belonging. So, you know, you know, you guys are just trailing excellence here in terms of the way that you're providing services. And, you know, that kind of leads me to, um, you know, when we were talking about um, just the grantees pivoting during the pandemic and, and just really having to just like be super creative in delivering services. I remember the love parade in 2020, <laughs> but I want you to answer this question around, you know, meeting the community's needs during the pandemic. Like what about that experience resonated the most for you? Wow. Um, I think we were so, um, we, we moved so quickly. And I think this is sort of to my point earlier of like programs are not really what we're entrenched in. It's really about relationships. I think because of that, we were able to pivot really quickly because um, we, we pivoted what could pivot, right? So like we took some stuff online, we took computer, we bought, we bought computers and laptop, like tablets, and we delivered stuff to people to make sure everybody could stay connected. We, we took MP3 players filled with beats to kids so that they could be writing and they could, we did, our digital arts team did online challenges and online, we did, we were online with Instagram every day. So kids could hop on and participate in the challenge. They would get gift cards for participating. So any of those kinds of things that we could do, we did it. But we also turned our youth center immediately into a food, into food. And so we, part we um, partnered with Dine 11 and um, World Central Kitchen, and we were delivering thousands of meals. Um, like literally that's all we were doing is driving around delivering meals. Um, and we were just, we really were not out of this, out, out of it for much more than a week before we were like pivoted and, um, and, and making sure that we were out. So a lot of like meeting kids on their stairs, like you stay up there, I'll stay down here. Like, let's, make sure that you can see my eyes or, you know, let me move way over here, take my mask off and smile at you. And like, right. Like the love parade was an example of that. And we went and did the, um, you know, we did the cups on the bridge that said, we love you and flew the dr our drone over it so that we could like, it was, I think, um, watching my staff really embrace the vision and go from like, we're scared about what's happening and we don't, we feel uncertain to let's rally as a, as a team, how do we keep ourselves mentally and emotionally safe and make sure that we're always on the lookout for these babies. And so, um, you know, like I said, we had kids die of overdoses. They were, they were not suicides. They were accidental fentanyl overdoses. Um, I just hate drugs and guns uh, with a passion. I just, we've lost so many babies. Um, but we did outdoor, um, uh, memorial services where we met in a park and made sure that that the kids could grieve together and you know we just tried to to have social distant um safe ways for people to to mourn the losses of their folks um and i think that's what that's what resonates for me is like if there's a will there's a way right and i think sort of on a in a weird note like we had been pushing in the closed juvenile hall for like you know what we could do like at CARC judges could actually do like, like hearings with kids when they get brought into CARC same day so that kids can get released to go home rather than being locked up in juvenile hall for, you know, two days to four days waiting for a hearing. Right. And everybody was like, no, 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 that's not possible. That's not doable. Well, it turns out in a pandemic, people can actually figure some stuff out. And so court started taking place online. And so now we have that in our back pocket to be like, yeah, actually it is possible. Right. Like, it may not be what you're used to, but you can no longer say it can't be done. And so I think there are, there are, those are some of the good things to me that came out of it, which is like, people are very resourceful and creative. And when, when you have to come up with stuff, we did a fundraising gala in the parking lot at Lake Merced. Like we turned our fancy gala into an outdoor parking lot. Um, and it was great. Like, so you can find 
ways to do what you need to do to be with people. And, um, and I think that was, that was watching my staff do exactly what I thought they would do, which is like catch this vision for, um, for how we're going to keep people safe right? How we're going to make sure our kids know they're not alone because it was a very lonely feeling yeah. um, and very scary. And, and, you know, it continues to be right. The, the repercussions and the ripple effects for all of us, I think are still being definitely felt. Um, but that's, I think probably what stands out to me is like, Hey, we can, we can actually manage anything we decide to, we thought it was going to be, you know, like closed down for a few weeks and reopen it turns out like, you know, pandemic virus had another plan, but, um, but we rallied. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So what do you envision for the future of Sunset Youth Services? Well, um, weirdly we're on a real estate takeover. So that's weird. Um, <laughs> speaking of the people who never wanted to scale. So, um, we, we like I mentioned, we took over a, a church. Um, so, uh, my husband actually is an ordained minister. And, um, and so there was a church that has, that we've had our eye on for years, um, that has basically not been doing anything. And so we're now in that building. We've taken it completely over and made it into our wellness center. Um, so our, our therapies, there are art therapy. We're doing drama therapy. We're actually doing cooking therapy. Um, we're, um, yeah, so we, we have like, we're building things in like yoga and gardening and just, but it's like not the chaos space, right? Like it's intentionally, it's off the Judah train line. It's, you know, it's just intentionally uh, has a courtyard area that we've set up so kids can come and write in journals and, you know, have a cup of tea or, you know, just chill, like just get out of their own space where they have to always be making sure they're safe and watching their own back. Um, and then. So we're building, building on that. Um, that's part of this capital money that we're getting from the state to kind of make some of those improvements. And then there's a church up the street from the center that is, that, that's a block up the street from where we currently are that we've been um, eyeballing for years that the, it's a Presbyterian church and the Presbytery actually is actively working to try to get that church um, either give us the church or let us buy it for really cheap or do a rent to own kind of anyway, there's a couple squatters in there right now, which I said, I wasn't willing to take over. So there's some things we're trying to work out. Uh, But ideally that will be another space that we'll be able to have as like a community hub. Um, And then we're the lead tenant um, for the community space of the teacher housing that's going in um, um, the Shirley Chisholm teacher educator housing which is right across the street from the Presbyterian church. So, um, so a lot of that for me, the vision of that is like, we've never owned property. Um, we've always been in long-term leases, thank God, but you know, we pay, we pay a lot of money in rent. And my, my thought is like, Ron and I are not getting any younger. Uh, my husband is turning 60 in November on his birthday. So, um, I know I keep giving him a hard time because that just sounds so big, but, um, when we, when we signed our lease on Judah, uh, they, they gave us a 10-year lease with two five-year options. And we signed it when Ron was 40. And we were like, ha, 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 you're going to be 60 when our lease is up. And now I'm like, oh, it's not funny anymore. Um, <laughs> since then, we have talked them into a few more years. So we still have some years on that lease. But, um, but I think sustainable uh, property, right, matters, right? A sustainable place to live that that um, keeps us in the in the community, keeps us viable, and not having to scramble to to keep up with market rate stuff. And so I think um, the bo- our board has had to pivot because we just have we have grown and we've gotten, you know, we've kind of moved out of our adolescent years as an organization and into like we're thirty years old this year, and so we've been celebrating our. 30 year, um, every month I'm doing like a history minute about that. We've been pushing out on, they're all on our website now. And, um, but like recognizing that we're in a place now where 
we need to start really thinking about what it means to be this old. And so I've been, we have a board retreat on Saturday and part of what I've been talking to my board chair and um, my kind of executive team about is what do we want from the board now that's, that's different, right? I used to have a very active working board that was the like, oh my God, I don't know if I can make payroll. What are we going to do board to now? Like, how do we think about what it looks like to purchase property and really, and really be sustainable for, for the long haul? Um, and I'm going to say something that I know also probably goes against the grain. And so I'm just, but I'm going to say like, I don't necessarily feel like Sunset U Services has to live longer than Ron and I. I think sometimes we get stuck in these like never ending organizations that like have to exist in perpetuity. And um, I think, you know, if like, we definitely still are the heart and soul of this organization and we don't have any plans to go anywhere. If it, if there's no succession plan and it doesn't outlive us, something else will come up in its place that someone else will hold that passion for. And so um, I think I'm not scrambling for a succession plan. Um, I am really, but I am really looking at like sustainability at the same time. Right. So it's kind of the both. And mm -hmm. like, I don't feel like, um, like there's a huge, like, oh my God, it has to outlive us. Otherwise it's not, it didn't matter. Um, I know that that's not true. Yeah. And so I think sometimes some organizations, some churches, some other places like should go ahead and die. Right. Like it's okay for that to happen. Yeah. And, um, and it doesn't mean it wasn't worthwhile while it was anyway. So that's no. my little two cents about things, <laughs> things that aren't actually talked about much. <laughs> yes. But Dawn, you and Ron and Sunset Youth Services has created such a great legacy in district four and across the city. And we see it in, in just the, just everything that's produced out of, uh, out of the programs and in the faces and hearts and of, of the young people that you guys serve. So unfortunately we're out of time and um, any Q and A, we will ask staff to just email me the questions. I'm gonna send them over to Dawn and we'll have a chance to have her respond to them during our Monday roundup <laughs> newsletter. But the last question um, is, tell us what's the song or anthem that inspires your grind and motivates you to continue serving communities. This was one that I felt so I really took some time thinking about, but I, I sent over this song that some of our kids did a few years ago for a specific event we were doing that was um, sort of honoring the, the um, San Francisco. And, um, and it's, um, it, it, it uses, we built this city on rock and roll as a part of the kind of like hook, but the words that the, the kids, the verses the kids came up with, it's really about like, this is the city that was built on the backbones of blue collar workers that now can no longer afford to live here. And they're paying bridge toll to come across the, the, the bridge and work in the city that actually belongs to us. And we want to take our city back. And, um, and so I think that song, um, I'm gonna, look, I'm getting all emotional. That song means so much to me because I feel like I see every day um, I just, I see our kids being pushed out of the city that they love. And San Francisco is one of those cities that like, weirdly, we're all more loyal to the city than it is to us. I mean, and I know the city is just, a, a, it's not actually a thing like, but like, sometimes it feels like, um, like we love San Francisco more than San Francisco loves us back. And I think, um, you know, in the wake of COVID and some other things, it felt a little bit like, Hey, we're out here, like, we're on the grind, we're putting ourselves at risk, we're doing all these things. And then like, there is very little recognition for what sort of the role nonprofits and other folks have played to keep things moving. And, um, and so I think for me, this song just like get, gets me sort of in a space of like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this so that hopefully we're saving the city for the kids who really love it. And it's not just a playground to us. Like this is home, this is not just like, rich people's playground. So that's the song. All right. And on that note, let's go ahead and hit it, DJ. <laughs> <laughs>
till we make it. The mission you can take it. Feel more than I'm fake. This is real life, man. Shout out to my gang. I love Frisco. Don't panic, no disco. Still pulling out his dog. Check out my wrist go. I know you're full of my damn flow. Can't take away the city. I ride with the city. I came from the city. Ain't no longer my city. Amazing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, staying seven minutes after. <laughs> Can I just share a quick Dawn story? When she talks about how she wants every kid to have their norm moment, like when you walk into the Cheers bar. <laughs> so Dawn and I ran into each other at a non, I'm not going to share with you what restaurant it was, a fast food <laughs> restaurant. I was there eating fast food. Um, I walked in and then we saw each other and we were chatting and literally like five, 10 minutes into the conversation, someone from like at the door says, grandma. And, and it was like, this whole family comes rushing over, hugs her. Everyone's calling her grandma. This young lady's calling her mom. And I'm like, I know she only has a son and she has a daughter-in-law, but neither one of these people are either one of them. But they're like hugging her, calling her mom, and their children are calling her grandma. And it just shows like, not only does she talk about relationship as being core, like she and Don, uh, Ron really like lives it. Like when they talk about family, they really mean family, even at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> she said it. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Thank you, Maria. Thanks you all for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye everybody, thank you.